damn. That sucks. Oh, I'm going to repeat everything. No, I'm just kidding. It's not on the video for the class, so I just remember to turn it on. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. Okay, so what we're going to do is we want to define integrals now. Okay? And it's going to turn out that the analyticity of the functions which we're integrating is going to play as big of a role in integration as it did in differentiation. In fact, it's going to play a much bigger role. It's going to be the key to a lot of the special properties of integrals hold. So let us consider... Huh, the z-plane. And... We can coordinatize it with x and y. And then we can consider a contour along which we want to perform the integral. Okay? Now remember, a complex space is two-dimensional. So you could do an integral over both the real and imaginary variables, but we want to start with a complex integral over a single complex variable, but we don't want to restrict it to a straight line or anything. So we want to do an arbitrary contour. Sorry, Alex, real quick question. Yeah. So No, no, no. So, sorry. These aren't. Sing these are. These. This is just the beginning and the end of a path. That's it. Okay. There's, there's nothing weird about those points. Okay. It's just the. But, but I mean, obviously, A and B will actually play an in interesting role in a few minutes. But, but right now, A is the beginning and B is the end, and that's it. There's nothing special about those points. Gotcha. Okay. So the contour we can label as Z of T where A is Z at TA, B is Z at TB, and what we're doing is we're parameterizing our evolution along the contour in terms of some parameter T. And then you kind of know the story. We can take this thing and we can break it up into a lot of small elements given by the, the intervals in T. And so we can, instead of taking a continuous function, we can break it up into a lot of little chunks, delta zi, which would be z at t i plus 1 minus z at t. And we can take each of these little chunks of the curve and we can replace them by straight lines as long as this uh, delta t is small enough. Or sorry, as long as delta, delta z is small enough. And then what we end up with is the following. The limit as the magnitude of delta z i goes to zero of the sum over i equals zero to n, where n is just large enough to cover all of the delta z's that make up the curve, of w z i delta z i. Okay, and notice this is just the this is just the complex planes interpretation of the Riemann sum. That's it. Okay? That's going to define the integral over the contour of W, Z, D, Z. Okay? Where, of course, as delta Z goes to zero, N goes to infinity, but who cares? All right? Now, if we write wz as uxy plus ivxy and dz as dx plus idy, then this definition becomes integral around the contour of this guy which is wz, times this guy, which is dz, and that simplifies to u dx minus v dy for the real part of this product, plus i integral over c of u dy plus v dx for the imaginary contribution. Okay? 
You're integrating a complex function, so obviously the answer can be complex. It's got a real part and an imaginary part, okay? And to get the real part, you just multiply this expression times this expression, and you just take the real part of it, and then to get the imaginary part, you do the same. Okay, so that should be simple. This should be written down because we're going to make use of it regularly. Okay? That's u dx minus v dy plus i times u dy plus u v dx. Okay, now what we can do is we can take a few functions and shove them in there and see what their integrals look like. So let's start with the next two simplest function we can imagine. What's the simplest function we could possibly integrate? One, a constant. Yeah, but let's not do that. Let's do the next. Z. Z, yes, we're going to do Z. Okay? So we're going to integrate Z along a contour or two. We'll actually do it around two contours. Okay? So here we go. Contour number one. We're going to start at the origin and we're going to end at the point negative 1i. And our contour is going to be a straight line. And you remember, we want to orient the contours. So we're starting at A, and we're going up to B, and we're just moving along this diagonal line. OK? Now, realize that in doing this, since every bit that we move up along the Y, so this is a i and this is minus 1. Every bit that we move up along y, we also move in the negative x direction. Okay, it's the equation of a line. So we can, of course, replace x with minus y everywhere and replace dx with minus dy everywhere. And for the bounds on what we're doing, we can say that x initial is 0 and x final is minus 1, and we can use this in this expression, okay? We can write everything in terms of x and dx. Okay, just replace y, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I gotta write one more thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, what is u? So z, sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't write something down. Z is x plus i y. What is u? It's just x. What is v? It's just y. Okay? So now we take all that and we plug it into here. It's that straightforward. Okay? And if we do it, what we end up with is the following. Okay, I'll do one if you do the other. Done. Sorry, I beat you. Josh. Josh. Which one? Lewis. All right. These are the same, so that's minus 2x dx if I integrate x dx, what do I get? x squared over 2. So that 2 cancels this 2. So I have x. minus x from 0 to minus 1. What does that give me? Minus 1. What? Never mind. That was 2 to the 1. It's going <laughs> to I can almost see the board. It's going to be minus 1. Yes. Times i. Oh. Yes. 
Okay? Good, man. Great. So just, just remember, this is minus 2x dx. If I integrate that, I get minus 1 half x squared. Yeah, if I plug in standard. minus 1, this is still negative. Okay, and if I multiply it by the factor, or, uh, sorry, sorry, I don't get that one now. I get that. Anyway, okay. I know you guys can follow these steps. All right, so now let's try another path. All right. And this is where we're going to start seeing the magic arise. I want to start at A, I want to go to B. The same A and B, except this time, I'm going to go straight up and then straight over. Okay, I can call this one, I can call this two. I hope that's what I call it on my sheet. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, so during phase one, of going straight up, what is dx? Zero. It's zero. What is x? Zero. Zero. During phase two, what is dy? What is y? Not zero. I plus. Well, well, it's so it's x plus i y. Oh. So y is one. Okay. Everybody following me? Dy, of course, in phase one is non-zero, and y is increasing, and dx is non-zero in phase two, and x is decreasing. Okay, so those will allow that these are fixed. Now I just take all that and shove it in here. Okay? And if I do so, this is what I get. I get 0, 1, minus y, dy, plus integral 0, minus 1, x, dx, plus i, integral from 0 to minus 1, of dx. Okay, that's the only non-zero terms. What do you guys think? You're going to get the 1 minus i, aren't you? No. These two are going to cancel. Oh. Because um. you're going to get x squared, you're going to get y squared. Plugging in minus 1 and 1 isn't going to change anything, but they're subtracted. Mm -hmm. So this is going to give me minus i. OK? It's the same thing I got before. Hmm. All right? Now, what if I told you this is an analytic function, therefore it's path independent. You can pick, you could pick any path you want from A to B, and you'll always get the same answer. I believe you. Okay, good. We're going to carry on with that, but first I'm going to show you an example of when it doesn't. Let's consider a non-analytic function. Okay? We know that analytic functions only depend on z. They do not depend on z star. So if I give you the function as being z star, that function is definitely not analytic. Okay? What does it change in our story? It changes that. What else does it change? Well, it's going to change this to the following. This is now going to be x dx, x, no, 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 I'll just, do you want to do that? Yeah, I'll do this. I'll do this intermediate step. x dx plus y dy plus i integral along the contour of x 
dy minus y dx, okay? And now if I plug everything into this, I get integral from zero to minus one of x dx plus x dx plus i integral from zero to minus one minus x dx plus x dx. I'll do one if you do the other. Done. I don't have any takers. It's gonna give me one. Okay? Does everybody understand where this comes from? We good? It's the same path, so all of this still applies. The only difference was u and v in this expression. V was negative y, and u is, is x, okay? So if instead we choose this path, this part of the story stays the same, this part gets mixed up, and we get the following. Integral from zero to one of y dy, plus the integral from zero to minus one of x dx, minus i times the integral from zero to minus one of dx. What do you think? Huh? It's going to be different, you're damn right. It's going to be 1 plus i. Okay? So note, a non-analytic function depends on the path. Even if you start and end at the same points, picking different paths to get there will give you different results. Josh, what is that blinking? What's that blinking light? Oh, I think that's my actual other monitor. Okay, it's freaking me out. Sorry. And All Seth, right. why are you glowing? Okay, it's fine. You guys just keep at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, sorry, I gotta, I gotta think for a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now here is the incredibly important observation. Are you ready? Yeah, you are, you are. Actually, I'll just pick on somebody. Uh, Joel. Joel? Yes, I'm here. If you have an analytic function for which the integral from between two points is path independent, what can you conclude about the integral around a closed path? Well, you can take your loop and you can make it so small that there's nothing there, so it's zero. Yes. A closed path is one that starts and ends at the same point. But if the integral is path independent, here's the path I'll take. You ready? I'm done. We teach that in physics one. Okay, we're talking about conservative forces. But nonetheless, yes, if you have a path independent integral, which is the case for analytic functions, then the, the integral around a closed path is zero. What about a non analytic function? It does not have to be zero, it could be zero. But in general, it's not, okay? It depends on which closed path you take, all right? Okay, so again, this is the magic of analytic functions. Now, I wanna say, you might think this is not, this is not a democracy, <laughs> okay. okay? Because what the fork makes Z more special than Z star. Why can't you do all of this with Z star and let Z be the, the bum child? Stupid ass. You're going to explore that on your homework. Okay? And 
BTW, there's nothing special about Z. You could do it with Z star. Okay, so here we go. We are ready to give you the theorem. And I want to say, this, this was suggestive stuff, but now I'm about to get concrete with it. And then we'll follow through with some examples. But here we go. We have Cauchy's theorem. Which says the following. If a function wz is analytic with n and on a closed contour, c, And the derivative is continuous in this region, then the integral around the closed contour of the function is zero. Now notice, this is a little bit more, oh, and sorry, this is a theorem. Don't worry, I'm not going to prove it. We're beyond proving things now, we're just going to use them. But anyway, um, this is a little more conclusive of a result than what we were talking about before, where we were saying if you have an analytic function, and we were just kind of saying an analytic function as if this thing is analytic everywhere. Our example was z. It's analytic everywhere. In fact, that's, what do we call an, an analytic function everywhere? Entire. It's an entire function, okay? And what we argued was if a function is entire, then you can pick any two paths you want. Here is the special restriction that will include functions which are analytic in some regions but not others, okay? If I draw the contour I'm interested in, and maybe the, maybe the function has a branch point there, and there, and there, but if there's not a branch point inside of this or on the curve itself, then you can pick, you can pick this curve or any curve inside of it, actually, and the integral around that closed contour is gonna be zero, okay? Now this is where it gets interesting. We want to jack this up and give you the real result. The real result is not Cauchy's theorem, but the cauchy gorsat theorem. And the cauchy gorsat theorem, gorsat theorem says this. Now, what do you think the cauchy gorsat the Gorsat extension to Cauchy's theorem, is actually saying? Sophia. Sophia. I forgot I was muted. Um, what do I think it's saying? Like, what do I think the Gorsat? I don't know. What is Gorsat's extension to Cauchy's theorem? Do you want me to read it? Sure. I think she froze. Yeah, she froze. Do you want, her, do you want help? No, I'll just, I'll just read it. <laughs> I'll read it. Thank you. Okay. Um, what Gorsat came in to prove is that if a function is analytic within and on a closed contour C, 
all of its derivatives are actually automatically continuous. All of its derivatives. The first derivative, the second derivative, the nth derivative. Okay? So you don't have to include that in the conditions. It's automatic. All right? So all we need is to know the function is analytic. We don't need to know about its derivative being continuous or existing because it's automatic. It's going to happen. So if we have an analytic function and we have a closed contour, then uh, if we have a closed contour upon which and then inside of which the function is analytic, then the integral around that contour is zero. This result gives us a lot of byproducts. I'm actually doing pretty good today. I'm competing with the finish line. No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's look at some of the results. First of all, it tells us, this might seem weird because we started with path independence and we talked about how path independence implies that going around a closed interval or a closed contour gives you zero. But now you can take a closed contour being zero and you can reinstate the path independence. Okay? And the way you do that is pretty simple. All you do is you say, okay, um, consider uh, the integrals around C1 and C2. <coughs> or sorry, the integrals along path C1, which connects A to B, and an integral along contour 2, which connects A to B. Okay? Well, what does contour 2 take us from and to? Or sorry, did I say that right? Negative contour 2, yes, that's what I meant. Yeah, this takes us from B to A. So if we integrate around C1, WZ DZ, plus the integral around minus C2, WZ DZ, if WZ is analytic, what is this? Zero. It's zero, because this is a closed path, okay? Now I have something plus something equals zero. That's pretty sweet. We know how to massage that. Oh, but wait, those two minus signs cancel. There you go. Yes? Does this apply to the examples we looked at earlier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though they weren't closed. Yeah, they weren't closed paths. No, no, so this is taking A and B, considering one path, oh, okay. considering another path. But then reversing this path turns the combination of the two into a closed loop. Okay, so you're adding C1 to minus C2. But then if the sum of those is zero, then you can move one to the other side and then the negative in front of the integral cancels the negative in the bounds. Okay, so there you go. Path independence shines. The fundamental theorem of calculus. Can anybody remind me what the fundamental theorem of calculus says? <laughs> I, want, I want hands raised and thumbs up in Zoom if you can immediately tell me what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. It's, it's rather interesting. Okay, okay, that's fine. I know you never use it, except you always used it. You always used it, you just never named it. Okay. Is this the one where it's like, it's just the integral is the, you do like the antiderivative and plug in the endpoints? Yeah, so you remember to define an integral, what did you use to define integrals? Like an antiderivative? No, what did you use to define the integrals? Definite integrals. You can do an indefinite integral as well, but you use the Riemann triangle sum. You didn't say a damn word about antiderivative. And then later on they said, 
oh, but there's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? Yeah. So, I'll write it down because even seeing, like, how do you write that down? You write it down like this. If f of x is the integral from x naught to x of g of x prime dx prime, then g of x is equal to what? The derivative of x. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay? Well, now that we have integration defined and we have differentiation combined, can define, then we can simply extend the fundamental theorem to complex valued functions of complex valued variables. Okay? And there's a demonstration of this in the book. I'm not going to go through the details of it. It's not just taking this and copying it down. Okay? But, it, but it's important because you have to remember we've got to go back and look carefully at every definition we've done in real analysis and make sure it extends nicely to complex analysis. Okay? I mean, this is not a single variable. This is not a single, these are two variable things. Z is dependent on X and Y, where X is the real component and Y is the imaginary component. So there's something non-trivial here, but it does work out. Now I'm going to write another result, which is perhaps one of the more important ones. And this is the Cauchy integral formula or CIX. Joe, debtors. Yes. I think you're making a lot of noise. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if WZ is analytic, Within and on a contour C, then for any point Z naught interior to C, we get the following. the value of the function at the point Z naught the value of the function at Z naught is 1 over 2 pi i times the integral around the contour of C of W of Z over Z minus Z naught. That is, the value of the function at this point can be determined in terms of the values of the function on the contour itself in conjunction with how far those points are from that point Z naught. That's the denominator. on board? I'm impressed. Yeah, okay, good. Impressed is good. Impressed is good. All right. Now, um, let me go to four, and then we're going to turn this into uh, some examples. Yeah, I can. Okay, so derivatives of analytic functions. Um, and a 
again, I'm not going to go through the details, but using the Cauchy integral formula, one can show that all derivatives of analytic functions are analytic. That is, if a function is analytic over a certain region, then all derivatives of that function over the same region are also analytic. Obviously, if there's a singular point, then the function is not analytic there in the first place. In order to show you the power of this, let's actually consider the alternative, which is the real case. If I think about the real case, and I just think about the function f of x equals x times magnitude of x, if I plotted this, then I get this nice, smooth function. Which looks like that. It's basically x squared, except this branch of x squared is flipped over. Okay? However, f prime of x is 2 times the magnitude of x, which, of course, you know if you plot it, it looks like this. So that's supposed to be a straight line. Yes. So even though this function is smooth and it's differentiable, the derivative itself, the second derivative of the function doesn't exist at x equals 0. Okay? You try and, if you try and take the derivative of this, you end up with a step function, and x equals 0 plays a difficult role in the step function. Okay, and then last but not least, but the important thing is, is that for analytic functions, this is not going to happen. If you've got a smooth analytic function, every damn derivative of it's going to be smooth. Okay, there might be zero, but they're going to be smooth. All right, and then my last point before we move on is Louisville's theorem. Always put hands in red. If WZ is entire, meaning it's analytic throughout the entire Z plane, and if the magnitude of the function is bounded, over the entire plane. That is, there's a maximum value that that function reaches no matter what value of z you plug in. Okay? We good? Like a, like there's a global maximum or like a boundary? Yeah, like there's a global maximum. There's the, 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 the function, you know, it kind of maybe oscillates or goes up and down or whatever, but if over all values of the input z, it never goes above a certain amount, where it's less than infinity, okay? Everybody understand the, 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 the getting ready for this? Because this result is pretty amazing. Wz is a constant. That's pretty amazing. There are no functions which are analytic everywhere, which are not constant, which don't shoot up to infinity somewhere. That's the, that's the reverse reading of this. Okay? I mean, think about it. Sine of x, where this is a real variable x, that just oscillates between 1 and minus 1 everywhere. Sine of z, that's an analytic function. Z is complex, it probably goes to infinity at the end. 
if you actually take z to be complex, then this incorporates the hyperbolic sign as functions of real variables. It's hyperbolic function, which of course goes to infinity. Okay, all right. Is that how we can arise with number three? Sorry, say it again? Is that how we get to number three? Or no? No. Okay, so now I'm going to try and crunch through. I thought somebody said something. This is my skill. Oh, okay, so now I'm going to try and crunch through this last part, and this will finish up our discussion of integrals so that next time we can get through. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to want this. Okay, so here we go. Now, we know the cauchy borsat theorem and the cauchy borsat theorem is, is basically a statement about complex valued functions in the complex plane. But remember, the complex plane has a baby. I know. <laughs> what is the complex plane's baby? It lives deep inside of it, right in the middle. The real line. The real line. So you've got to admit that if you think about the world of complex analysis, both the complex variable and the complex value function, somewhere in it is the story of good old real valued functions of real variables. Or actually, maybe they're complex valued functions, but of a real variable x. So you can wonder if this machinery can go into helping us evaluate the integrals of functions of a real variable x. OK? So here we go. Let's take. The real line in the complex plane, so this is the z plane, and consider maybe some integral from minus r to r along the real axis. Okay? Now, suppose that the thing I'm trying to integrate has a bad spot right there at A, or actually I'll call it alpha. It's going to turn out that the integral of this function from minus r to r can be evaluated using the complex properties if we just adjust the path. And I'm actually going to exaggerate this, even though it doesn't need to be this big. OK, where we have a path here around half a circle of radius delta. But that's not all we want to do, right? Because the power of Integrals in the complex plane is when they are around what kind of contours? Closed. So why don't we just bring this home? Here's the important observation. If we wrote down the integral around this closed contour, it includes the integral from minus r to r as part of it. And we can break it down into pieces. But there is this little headache, OK? And that's what we're going to focus on now. So first of all, in order to introduce this headache, what we can say is the following. Let's assume that the function f of z, and now I'm going to use f for my function instead of w, just because I want to find the integral of f of x. Normally I use f for real functions and w for complex valued functions. 
But I'm going to use f for the complex value function this time, that way f of x comes out a bit naturally. Assume f of z is analytic over the upper half of the complex plane. That's the only place where our story is going to play out, so that's the only place it needs to be analytic. Okay? And now, what I want to consider is the integral around this closed path of the function of z divided by z minus alpha. Where z minus alpha is what's going to call this alpha point problematic, or 1 over z minus alpha. Okay? Now, notice in the contour that I've drawn, f of z is analytic, because the whole contour lives in the upper half plane. So too is 1 over z minus alpha, because this point doesn't live in or on the contour. And this 1 over z minus alpha is fine everywhere else. So this is analytic, this is analytic. What about their ratio? Is the ratio of two analytic functions analytic? It should be. Yes, we talked about that last time. Okay? So what is the value of this integral? Uh, it should be zero. It's zero. Exactly. Okay? So now what we can do is we can break this integral up into four pieces. Here we go. So breaking it up, let me see. Do, 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 do. I'll just try it here. Here we go. So we can integrate from minus r. We'll start here and go this way. Minus r to alpha minus delta. F of x over x minus alpha. No need to call it z if you're integrating along the x-axis. Plus the integral over the semicircle of radius delta of f of z over z minus alpha dz. Going here, we're definitely in complex land, so we have to label things by z. And this circle is the circle of radius delta. We're only going to go over half of it plus the integral from alpha plus delta to r of, again, going back to the real case because we're now on the real axis again, and then the integral over the half moon. Where notice that this is actually a hemisphere its radius is r, so going over the semicircle of radius r. Okay. Now, we're going to add in another assumption about f of z. We're going to assume that the magnitude of f of z goes to zero as z goes to infinity. That is, this function, at least in the range of c, sorry, this is in the contour c, if the, if I, well, it's actually in the upper half plane, sorry, in the upper half plane. So as we move further and further away, the function's value is going to go to zero. Okay? Wait a minute. Hold on. What if it was going to zero as z goes to infinity in the entire plane? And it's analytic over the entire plane. Or the, the maximum would be in the middle somewhere. Well, if you're if you're analytic throughout the entire plane, 
then do you ever go to infinity? No. And you're not going to infinity at z goes to infinity, so what can you tell me about the function f in that case? It's constant. It's constant. Oh. Yes. That's one of the reasons why we're relaxing our assumptions about the lower half of the complex plane. Okay? At any rate, here we go. Okay, so, do, 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 do. In this case, the integral over S of R goes to zero. Okay? That's this, this integral right here. Because fz is going to zero. Uh, sorry, this is as r goes to infinity. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I know where I'm going in mind. I just have to remember whether I've said it or not. As r goes to infinity, this integral goes to zero. So the only three we have left in our sum are the first three. And now let's break those down. So we're going to be left with the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from minus r to alpha minus delta of f of x over x minus alpha dx plus the integral from alpha plus delta to r of f of x alpha or x minus alpha. This is going to be equal to minus the integral over the delta radius circle of f of z over z minus alpha dz. Okay? Remember, the sum of all these is zero. We argued that that's zero, so the sum of the other two, as r goes to infinity, is minus the other one. All right. Now, I'm going to rewrite this side in a very interesting manner. First of all, I'm going to rename this P of the integral from minus R to R of F of X over X minus alpha DX, where the P stands for the principal value of the integral. All right, and you'll understand what I mean in a minute, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit that delta goes small, because we're not actually writing down the integral from minus r to r of f of x just yet. Okay, this is not that integral, because you've got this chunk in there. Okay, but we're going to take delta to be small and see how it impacts this. So this is the principal value of the integral. This guy, I'm going to rewrite in this very strange fashion, minus f of alpha integral over the circle of dz over z minus alpha minus the integral over the circle of f of z minus f of alpha over z minus alpha dz. All I did was I added integral of f of alpha over z minus alpha minus integral of f of alpha over z minus alpha. I just I did one of those fancy add zero to it. Okay. This thing right here, it turns out, is just i pi times f of alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, just the derivative. Yeah. Sorry. The derivative gets screwed up. Okay? This one, although it might not be obvious, is zero. Okay? 
And don't worry, I'm going to come back and I'm going to go through some of this in more detail in a minute. But then what we have is that the limit, as r goes to infinity, of the principal value minus r to r of f of x over x minus alpha dx is just equal to i pi times f of alpha. All right? Now, notice there's an r there. f is a complex valued function, even though x is a real variable. f can have an, a real and an imaginary part. So what we can do is we can say, all right, the real part of the function evaluated at alpha, the real part of this is the imaginary part of this. And the imaginary part of this you can get from the real part. That probably looks a bit like a Fourier transform, doesn't it? This is called the Hilbert transform. Now, if you need to go, go. I apologize, but I'm going to take at least another five minutes to get through the last page of notes. This is actually applying these to examples. So if you need to go, go, you can watch this video later. I don't want you to feel like you're, you're stuck. But I've got to finish this because we're going to move on to two more topics on Tuesday to finish up this chapter. Okay. This can be very handy in a couple of different situations, and I'm going to... I'm going to try and get rid of this. I don't think we'll need it. I'll probably regret it. Anyway, OK. So here's our first case. Imagine if we were wanting to integrate dx over x from minus r to r. OK? Now that's a real integral. If I wanted to integrate dx over x, what's the answer? So the function 1 over x, is it symmetric or anti-symmetric? It's anti-symmetric, so what's the integral? Say it again. Yeah, it's going to be zero. But you can't formally do this integral because it blows up at x equals zero, which is part of the, the range of coordinates. Okay? However, if we apply the principal value to it, then we have the limit as delta goes to zero of the integral from minus r to minus delta of dx over x plus the integral from delta r dx over x. So I can take this and I can replace x with minus y and dx with minus dy, in which case this becomes the integral from r to delta of dy over y plus the integral from delta to r of dx over x. What's that? That's zero. Okay. So the principal value of the integral is a methodology for actually evaluating this integral even though there's this headache point in the middle. Well now I want to extend this and I want to consider minus r to r of dx over x minus alpha. 
okay? which obviously has a problem when x is equal to alpha. So in this case, if we write the principal value of minus r over r dx over x minus alpha dx, then this is the limit as delta goes to zero of the integral from minus r to alpha minus delta of dx over x minus alpha dx plus the integral from alpha plus delta to r. Or, uh, Uh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. I do have too, too many of them in my paper. Um, I am just copying my notes, <laughs> which are screwed up, okay? And again, we can set x to minus y, in which case this becomes the limit as delta goes to zero of the integral from r delta minus alpha dy over y plus alpha. This integral I can just do. It's the integral of one over x minus alpha, that's a natural log. Plugging in the limits, this is gonna give me ln r minus alpha minus ln delta. This integral I can do as well, plug in the limits. And then what we're gonna end up with is the limit as delta goes to zero, of ln delta coming from this one minus ln r plus alpha plus ln r minus alpha minus ln delta. The ln deltas cancel, and so what we're left with is the natural log of r minus alpha over r plus alpha. Okay? No, 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 no. So using, using this definition for the integral is using the principal value. So, okay. Cool. I think I get this. Okay. All right. So one more case, and this is where it's all going to get tied together. And it will use those results. That's one of the reasons why I couldn't skip these. And now we can consider the last one. P of the integral from minus r to r of a function of x over x minus alpha. So this is the principle of minus r to r of f of alpha over x minus alpha dx. That's where I need my dx's. Oh man, and I left it out of my notes. I suck. I include too many when I don't need them, and then I leave them out when I do need them. Okay, this is again just playing that trick where I add n zero. Zero is integral of f alpha over x minus alpha. Okay? This guy, I know what it is. Because f alpha is just a constant. So that's really just the integral from minus r to r of dx over x minus alpha, which is what we're integrating here. So this guy is going to be f of alpha, natural log of r minus alpha over r plus alpha. Now, why did we do this? Well, where's the headache point for the function one over x minus alpha? At x equals alpha. Does this have a headache point at x equals alpha? You're all the zero. You are, so what do you have to do? You apply L'Hopital's rule. So you take the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. Well, that's going to give me f prime over 1. OK? 
okay? As long as the derivative exists, then this is going to give me Well, sorry, sorry, let me, if, if, if f of prime, if f prime of x exists, then this thing is not problematic at all, which means we don't need the principal value. We just talk about the integral, because there's no point of difficulty that you're integrating through. Okay? Are we good? This is poorly defined, but what it's doing, <laughs> like it's the principal value. Yeah, so it's, it's doing that integral and then bumping over the problem point. But what I'm saying is, so if I had done f of x over x minus alpha, if I did that, then there, there's a problem point at x equals alpha. Okay. But because I rewrote it this way, the top is going to zero as x goes to alpha, and the bottom is going to zero as x goes to alpha, so we have to use L'Hopital's rule. Yes. But L'Hopital's rule says as long as the derivative of f exists, okay? Yeah. So, we're almost there, folks. Here we go. All right, so we have p integral from minus r to r, f of x over x minus alpha, dx. Man, I'm missing a lot of these. <laughs> plus the integral from minus r to r. I don't know why I just wrote all this down again. I guess I wanted to summarize or some shit. But anyway, there we go. And then the limit as r goes to infinity, this becomes i pi f of alpha. Okay. equals zero, the limit of this as r goes to infinity is zero, plus the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x minus f of alpha over x minus alpha dx, which tells me, of course, that f of alpha is minus i over pi, integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x minus f of alpha over x minus alpha dx. Again, I can break this up into its real and imaginary components. And that gives me one over pi integral from minus infinity to infinity of the imaginary part of the function of x minus the imaginary part evaluated at alpha over x minus alpha dx. Identity, or that's the imaginary. In the imaginary component, is minus one over pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f r x minus f r alpha over x minus alpha dx. Okay? And let me show you what that can be used for very quickly. Suppose that my function was e to the i z, okay? If we use that z is r e to the i theta, then obviously f of x magnitude goes to zero as r goes to infinity, actually, for the angles so this function is satisfying that criterion that fz magnitude goes to zero if we go far away, okay? Well, let's look at it. fr of x is cosine x. fi of x is sine x. And this is cosine z plus i sine z. Now 
we can just use this expression, and we can say, okay, um, if fi, so I'm going to use the fi, and then use this expression for the fr's. So if I do fi at alpha, then that's sine of alpha. And I said I'll do the other. I'll do the. I use the real. So we can say that cosine of alpha is one over pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine of x minus sine of alpha over x minus alpha dx. Well, let's just take cos let's just take alpha equals to zero, in which case this is one. Yes, it is. It is. But it's not the only goal of all of this. Okay, you can actually find many, many integrals from this context. Okay? But it's an example of using the complex analytical part of the story to generate real integrals and to find them. Okay? All right, we'll stop there. Thanks to you guys so much for staying. Sorry uh, keeping you so long, but we're done. That's the good news. <laughs>